At AIA Australia, we have the tools and support to help you grow your business. Available 24-7, our Business Growth Hub offers an online suite of resources such as marketing tools and help to build out your health and wellbeing proposition. If you're looking for a trusted business partner, chat to your AIA CDM today. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to XY Live for this week. Uh, this week, we've got uh, someone very uh, dear to the XY community, Dylan Martin from Feel So Good Wealth Management down in the Gong, uh, or Wollongong as the, uh, the out-of-towners call it. Um, and today, we're talking all about uh, succession planning and how Dylan has effectively become his boss's succession plan, the journey, what it looked like, and, and uh, some of the lessons learned along the way. Um, firstly, just a special thank you to our mates at AIA for uh, for their support of these XY Live sessions. So, welcome, Dylan. Great, great to have you. Um, first up, can you just tell us a little bit about your background uh, into advice and and your practice? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I'll try and cut a really long story short. Uh, but yeah, first of all, thanks for having me on. And uh, a lovely group. There's lots of energy floating around, which has definitely invigorated me as well, which is which is great. So, thanks to everybody who tunes in and who contributes. It's it's fantastic. So, long story short, I was born in South Australia. I spent the first 17 years of my life there. Um, basically, as a kid, I always loved numbers and finance. Uh, I used to look at the stock quotes in the paper when I was about 13 or 14 not really knowing what to do with them or what they were, but I still looked them up and circled things and looked at patterns and all that sort of stuff. So I knew I liked numbers and finance. Um, basically, I met my now wife in 2004 in year 10. And long story short, at that point, I wanted to do sort of finance and banking. And she actually um, moved, moved back to New South Wales. My dad was in the Air Force. And so we did two years of long distance. And essentially when I finished year 12, I was, I had my heart and my head set on banking, banking and or finance. So I decided to move over to New South Wales, leave my family and friends behind essentially to be with my now wife, Sarah. And obviously in the back of my mind, I thought there would be better opportunity in Sydney or in New South Wales. Uh, I actually got into uni. I got into University of Wollongong. I got offered uh, a finance degree and I was this close from declining it because I had my heart and my head set on banking. And my wife, Sarah, my now wife, Sarah, we'll just call her Sarah. She <laughs> said, look, you'd be mad to decline the offer. Why don't you defer it for a year and see how banking goes and then work out the rest from, from there. So I did. I deferred the offer for one year uh, just after I moved to New South Wales in Sydney. And I worked in retail banking for six months and I hated it. It was definitely not what I thought it would be. I uh, had a really bad experience with a big four bank and basically after six months I was just working in uh, standard retail and from then I took up the offer to go to uni. I did finance at University of Wollongong, which was great. At that point I still wanted to be in the finance or investment banking space, um, but it was... I I think it was the second semester of my second year, um, we had a surprise that we weren't expecting. Um, my wife fell pregnant, and so um, we had a baby on the way, and my son was born. And basically from there, my attitude towards everything changed. And I realised that to be working in finance or investment banking in Sydney, which is where most of these jobs are, requires a lot of travel, a lot of hours, a lot of grinding basically. And so I thought that maybe it wasn't going to be best for me. And because I love numbers and I love finance and I love people, I thought financial planning was probably a good, a good suit for me. And so I still finished my finance degree with a few electives in there for financial planning. And that's basically how I graduated and how I fell into financial planning. It was that change in my life um, in the second year of uni. So, okay, so you started looking at these opportunities for financial planning and, and what happened next? Uh, well, basically, I was, look, I'm really happy to be where I am today, but it was, it was a bit of luck in the, in the beginning. Uh, I was basically a couple of weeks off from finishing my final exams in November, or October 2010. And I essentially just emailed every single financial advisor in Wollongong saying, this is who I am, this is what the situation is, this is what I'm trying to 
to, to achieve here? Um, do you have anything available for me? And I got, that was on a Saturday, and I got an email back from Andre, who's my business partner now. He said, yeah, we're looking for somebody. Um, you want to come in for an interview? And really, it was, it was, that was it. I came in for two interviews, and I started working December 8, 2010. Okay, awesome. And can you tell us a bit about what, uh, what your business looked like back then? And, and what it looks like now? Uh, yeah, definitely. Well, at the time when I came on board as a sort of admin, power planner, sort of just learning the ropes, um, I, I believe there was a lot of, as a backlog of work, I think they had um, been short-staffed for some time. So there was a lot of work to be done and probably very, uh, quite unorganised initially. But essentially, uh, we had a pretty standard financial planning business, um, mostly made up of retirees and pre-retirees. Uh, I don't know what the average age was back then, but I, I dare say it was probably around 55 or so. And the one thing I did notice was there was very little um, insurance clients or risk um, business. So that was something that, um, that uh, my business partner uh, didn't enjoy or, or didn't, didn't really want to do too much of. Uh, and that's really the main difference to today versus back then. Um, and there was probably a lack of yeah, younger clients as well. Okay. Sure. So we'll, we'll talk a bit more about that, but can you tell us about how, like how your journey went? So you mentioned that you came in as more of the, the admin um, uh, back office uh, support type role. And obviously now you're, you're in partnership uh, with Andre. What, what were the steps in between and, and the conversations that happened along the way? Yeah. Okay. Well, first of all, I think anyone who's starting out, I mean, I was fresh out of uni, so I really had no idea. Anyone that's starting out, I think starting in the engine room is a great way to go. You know, doing the plans, meeting with clients, doing the admin, just just getting dirty in the engine room because you really understand how a business works or the business works and then you build up from there. So that was a really good first step. In the first meeting, I actually didn't mention this, in the very first interview that we had, which went really well, he actually mentioned that he was potentially looking for somebody to come in and over time replacing essentially you know be a succession plan use whatever other words you want to use but that was essentially what he said and to be truthful i didn't think much of it i didn't think anything of it i sort of just nodded and smiled like mm, okay yeah like mm. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't give too much thought to be honest I, I didn't think it was going to be for me I, I just thought well that's an option one day but that's not on my mind so that started to evolve over time um I started to become um, really hungry for for more, more challenges and more, basically more of any, anything and everything I could take on. Uh, and I really thrived on the responsibility and sort of started to treat it as if it was my own business, really being accountable and treating clients with you know, the most you know, highest level of respect and experience. Um, yeah, I just said one day, yeah, look, let, let's have that conversation again that we had all, all those years ago. I think it would be good to talk about it again and, it's just snowballed from there. Okay, so you were so you were uh, so you're working in the in the engine room, so to speak, uh, and then and then you ended up having these conversations with uh, with Andre. What where where were you at that stage? Like, how long had you been in the business for? Had you transitioned into already then doing more of the advice type work at that point? Uh, and what did that look like? Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. I missed, I missed a step there. So uh, I started in December 2010. I was looking at my notes here. Um, I became an authorised rep in April 2000 and, that should say 12, April 2012. And so from there, I really started to sit with a couple of smaller end clients on my own. But to be truthful with you, the best thing we ever did, and um, I encourage this for anyone who's in my was in my previous position, um, I actually sat in just about every single client meeting from the start. So review meetings or record advice meetings, annual review meetings, SOA presentation meetings, uh, first meetings, I sat in just about every single client meeting. So by the time I had my AR and I could start seeing clients on my own and then as that evolved, uh, clients knew me and they were comfortable with me and there was a really good level of trust there. And, and that was one of the main things he said was, let's make sure our clients fall in love with the firm on an individual advisor or person. Because if obviously one person goes away in anyone's business, that they may follow or they may not have a very close connection with the firm. 
Yeah. So really the conversation about um, equity and the bigger picture stuff probably started to get a bit more serious once I've got the AR or the web started to find my feet a little bit. That's probably when it started. And that was April 2012 and I purchased into the firm July 2013. So it was pretty quick. Yeah. Yeah. That's a massive. That's a massively quick turnaround. As someone that's uh, gone through a, a failed, uh, p- a, like partnership event, and and spoken to a number of other people that have, I think uh, that's probably one for the record book. So I would say your business yeah. partner. There's a bit of luck there as well. I mean, you can't help but to think that you know, I just was in the right place at the right time, but it's, it's been working good. So I'm really blessed. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, cool. Okay. And then, so how did you approach those discussions? Because Andre is obviously keen and uh, evidence in the fact that he, he's made it all happen so quickly. But, you know, what were the, what would, what did the discussions look like? Were there any points that you had to negotiate around? Was there any, um, you know, th- uh, key sort of issues that you, that you had to work through or that came up through that process? Uh. To be truthful with you, it was such a long time ago. I really wish I could offer some high-level detail or insight. It was just really casual conversations. They were quite casual, whether they were at the pub or in the office or whatever it was. They were quite casual, and I think we just built on the concept alone of what does it mean to, um, you know, to buy in or to become an equity partner or to take up equity. All those terms, we just talked in, in really in a really basic sense. Uh, and really, we just talked about what it would mean, what it looked like for him, and probably what, what did I think it looked like. And then we just talked about it from there um, in the early stages. And and then I guess we had to start looking at um, funding and what would it cost and how are we going to make it sort of fair and equitable. So he's happy, I'm happy, because obviously he wanted to get somebody in and he wanted this to work as much as I did as well. Did, did you get a loan at the bank or did you self-fund? Or did, or, did, or did you earn your way in? Yeah, it's a good, it's a great question. Look, this, I've got to say, this is by far, has been and still is the biggest challenge. Um, my situation's a bit unique, so a lot of people here will be potentially a little bit older and potentially have some equity in their home or something behind them, something to back them up. Now, I've got three young kids under seven. I've got no, uh, we're renting it. So we were, in a, we were in a position where, you know, we don't look very strong on paper, all right? Yeah. And so the, the, the simple answer is that um, we were not able to obtain anything um, that was suitable from any bank. And you've got to remember, pre-GFC, global financial crisis, the banks were loving this, loving this space. Big four banks, the smaller key banks, but as you guys may be aware, well aware, they've really tightened up in that space and a lot of them just don't want to get into it. Uh, and then you've got particular ties with you know, institutions and dealer groups and their intra-funding, and it gets a little bit um, cryptic. But in the end, we weren't able to get any help from a bank or our dealer group even as well. So the first lot was actually vendor financed, yep, which is pretty common as well with accounting and financial planning firms. Yep. So that means the, the, the vendor, so Andre, actually lent the money and you basically do it that way. Cool. That, that's, that, yeah, Andre seems like a very smart and uh, accommodating gentleman. Yeah, he's, yeah, he's fantastic. Yeah, we've been through a lot over, over the years. So yeah, he's fantastic. And so, Dylan, how did you, how did you, like, I don't want you to get into your numbers, but, but are you able to give us sort of the, the broad strokes on how you approach the, the buy-in? Like, was it like a, you, buy, you buy in with a small amount initially and then, and then with a view to increase over time? And was that sort of set in stone or dependent on anything? And, you know, what does the progression of that look like over time? Definitely. Uh, we didn't have anything set in stone, but we had a sort of a broad-based plan that we were, we were going with. So essentially, um, the plan was for me to take up 30% initially with the option of taking a, an additional uh, 19 in, in the previous, the next year after, basically. Uh, and that was going to be the first step to see how, see how it went and to basically, um, yeah, get me in and get me really, really started. So that was the plan, um, but it wasn't set in concrete. That second tranche was optional. Uh, but in my head, in, in his head, in a perfect world, we just wanted it to keep, you know, keep revolving and keep going and going and going. Uh, how did the conversation start? Well, we didn't have any elaborate schemes or, or formulas to, to work out, you know, what this business was worth. 
um, you guys or the viewers may be familiar broadly with, um, I think, the EBIT approach. There's an EBIT approach and there's a multiple of earnings approach, pretty common concepts that go around. We just used a, um, a multiple of reoccurring income. Okay, so we basically took an average of the previous three years of income and there was a, a magic number there, which you times it by and you work out roughly what the business is worth and then what, what it would cost to purchase a certain amount of um, units. Cool. Sure. Okay. And and how do you, and how did you personally like assess that? Did you use? Were there any like resources that you used, or um, people you lent on, like mentors or anything, to do a you know a sanity check and make sure that it was all you know going to work out in everyone's interest? For the actual pricing and the valuation, I, I, I didn't I didn't go to anyone. I, I obviously used resources online, guides online, um, and I guess I yeah yeah. Got a bit of information in, in 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 that sense, but I didn't go to anyone to cross check. You know, is this a great deal or is this a poor deal for me? Because I felt I had a pretty good understanding of what the going the going rates were for different types of income within a business, and I was quite comfortable. We settled with uh, we settled with Snap Bang on three. It might have been a little bit lower because there's a discount there, but we settled on three. Um, yeah. So I didn't I didn't get any mentoring. Yeah, yeah, pretty standard sort of um, multiples, I suppose. Most in fall in, into that sort of around the, around that number. Um, okay, and so did you have any? Was there any uh, sort of like ties to how you guys measured success in you know your work up to that point, or or as you were going through that buying process around you know perhaps revenue targets or client satisfaction or client numbers or anything like that, or um, was it independent of all that? Uh, what my what was what are you asking if it was independent? The actual decision to write it with you? No, so so as in like you know how you you started having these discussions that you you ended up buying in pretty shortly after the, in the in between period. Was there any like saying that we are going to um, you know uh, consider that a success or that you? that you'll be eligible if you had certain targets to reach to get there or no nah, no there was nothing like that there was no um no no revenue targets no set targets i think the the, the one thing i could probably offer there is that i remember him saying to me because he had a very good level of trust and he obviously you know believed in me and believes in me that he mentioned that you know he really loves it that i treat the business as if it's my own business when, when it wasn't so i've always been you know really um, accountable and, and basically um you know trying to run the business and help run the business even though i was just an employee bringing new processes new systems trying to improve things just basically going above and beyond for so many years and just treating it as if it was my life basically yeah so i had a really high level um level of trust between us but there was no targets or revenue targets or anything like that um, he was very happy with, with how everything was going and, and we were both very happy. Yeah. So. Awesome. Well, that's, uh, that's always good. Um, mm -hmm. And so have, was there anything like if you, if you went back to the start, is there anything that you would do differently next time around? Yeah, it's a good one. Um, I don't think so. I mean, what if I had any more information on my hand? I mean, Probably not. I dived into it. Um, I've always told myself that I would rather fail doing something and giving it a really red hot crack than not to have tried at all. So to be truthful with you, I don't know what information I might have been armed with if I went back, but I don't think I'd change anything. Uh, what about though in terms of the, the actual process and to make it happen, you know, more easily or smoother? That sort of from it from a you know from a mechanics perspective as well as from a higher level. Um, I think our process was yeah, relatively straightforward. We, we we drew up contracts and we had a look at it together, and we got someone to look at it independently as well. And yeah, I think that's going to be individual for every firm because we're a small firm. Like there's there's me, and then there's Andre, who's I guess on sabbatical. He doesn't really give it any advice any longer. And you've got one full time and a part time. Whereas in a much bigger firm. With you know two three partners and you know, three senior advisors and junior advisors, you've got a whole different makeup of, of structures and, and people's individual trust and the way that the company you know put together. I think at the end of the day, um, I was really hamstrung by the fact that I didn't have any equity or any uh, house behind me. 
and I had done things in reverse order, like, you know, kids first, you know, buy house much later on. No plants, no pets, just the kids. So I did things a little bit differently and that's perfect. It worked out the way it did. But I was a bit hamstrung in terms of I couldn't really come in with too much power because I had no very little funding ability. Yeah. But I just went through it. Did you, um, did you each have your own lawyer um, or did you use the same lawyer? Um, I'm just reading a question that's come through as well. Um, no, look, we definitely, it wasn't just a, a handshake agreement at the pub. We've obviously, you know, we worked through um, conversation over the years and built up a high level of trust and basically, um, no, so we just had the, we just had our contract that we drew up a templated contract which basically stated this is the terms in which you're buying the first tranche of, un- first tranche of units this is the cost um, here's some uh, other bits and pieces that we basically both, both agreed upon and we just uh, we just got a lawyer to look at it um, one lawyer just to make sure that it was okay yep. um, uh, and then I think and actually no I've got someone to look at it independently as well because that's what yeah we got a lawyer to look at it and then he recommended that I go look at, looked at it independently, which I did, and it was all, the actual contract was, was fine. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Okay, and then there's a uh, follow-up question here from uh, from David just asking about, like, saying that your uh, your initial agreement seems to be pretty pretty casual, um, but it, it, do you now, you, obviously you've got this contract which you're just talking about, but does that uh, cover, like, documented exit times for Andre? Yeah, we've got we've got the we've got it documented. Um, yeah, I guess you could say maybe not casual, but we tried to. It was quite we simplified it. We didn't make it too complicated because we both believed in what we were doing, and we both um, yeah believed in the in the transition and the succession. Um, there's no um, formal set in concrete exit plan for Andre, but we we, we communicate about this exact question um, every six months or so to see where we're both at. Um, and we've had we've both had different thoughts and changes over the years. So, um, you know, it's not documented, but I've got a fair idea of when um, when Andre's looking to, I guess, retire properly. Cool. Awesome. And so for people that people that are out there that might be, you know, in the position that you were uh, looking at, at doing, doing as being their boss's succession plan, what do you think are the most important things that you need to do or get right to ensure that that process is a success? That's a good one. Um, got a couple of points, but just want to make it re- really clear that every firm is going to be completely different, and the relationship with your boss or your senior advisor or equity partner is going to be completely different. Um, it sounds, it, it almost sounds like you know this is too good to be true, and it's a really casual ride through. But that's the way that we work. We we, we constantly talk to each other and see where we, we're at, and we're honest with each other. So it really works for us. Where a more contracted, formal, concrete agreement might work better for a different firm with different personalities. So let's make that clear. Um, look, I've always been a big believer in under-promising and over-delivering. And if you're in a firm that has potential equity opportunity available to you and you want it and you're hungry for it, just going above and beyond, being proactive and actually treating the business like it's your business, even though it's not, you just a you know, you're down the chain somewhere. Treat it like it's your own business. Yeah. Okay. Um, care for your clients and your and your income and and your staff like it's your own business, and that will get noticed because, yeah, that they're going to notice that you're hungry for it and that you're actually really, really genuinely um, hungry to run and look after the business. Not sure if that offers much, but that's how yeah. that's my that was my approach. Sure. And so what about like, because it sounds like this has all happened pretty, pretty smoothly from you by the sounds, but um, you know what, I suppose for people that, that want to ensure that their uh, philosophies are consistent between, you know, if they're going to be their boss to succession plan, because um, I know we've chatted off air and we'll, we'll talk about this in a sec, but um, mm. you know, about Andre being very open to you. Uh, you know, ha- uh, having a very big say in, you know, the approach that you take and how you want to do things and making changes in the business and those sorts of things. Did, was there a discussion that you guys had around that? And, and you know, if so, what are the, the learnings for, for others uh, in that area? Yeah. Um, I was going to say something, but I actually lost what I was going to say. So to answer your question, um, look, this is the thing. 
Andre has been on sabbatical, which essentially means he's been spending a bit of time overseas and a bit of time back in Australia uh, for the last three or so years. And essentially, as long as I've kept him up to date and we've, you know, kept talking about the bigger picture stuff, um, he's, he's, he wants me to and has given me the, the green light to just basically to run to run everything, to make changes where needed um, and run, run the bigger picture items um, past him. This is going to be different for another firm because if you've got a couple of equity partners or senior partners and they bring in a junior partner and they're all working on the business every day, providing advice, whether it's accounting, mortgage broking or financial planning, that's going to be different altogether. But because Andre had a, a period where he was sort of back and forth doing different things um, overseas and out of the office, that's how it's worked for us. Okay, it's, it's, It doesn't mean it will work like that for anyone or everyone, but that's how it's worked for us. And I love that because I love the responsibility. And yeah, absolutely. So did you guys have that chat beforehand, like before you agreed to, to go down the equity path? Um, no, but at the time of when it was all happening and, and he was um, shortly going to go overseas for a three or four month stint, uh, we would essentially agree, hey, look, so just so I know, I'm, I'll run things like normal, okay, um, and keep you up to date with the bigger, bigger picture stuff. And he said, that sounds good. Let's keep, you know, keep up to date. And, and as time went by, and even today, uh, there's probably less and less that he requires to hear or to see from us um, because he knows that me and the staff who have a great deal of passion for our clients are, are doing a great job of running the show and, and implementing little changes here and there. And he, he's got trust that we're doing the right thing. So there's never any need for any constant um, approval or tick off from somebody else. Okay, awesome. And so how... so. How do you guys work? Because I know that you've, you've been implementing a few changes in your business and, you know, trying to focus more on your younger clients since joining and, um, and, and streamlining things within the business as well. What, how have you approached that, given not so much in the discussions with Andre necessarily, but in, given that it's an older business and, you know, there are these number of areas that you're working on, how do, how do you... How did you? How do you come up with your your strategy, and 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 how do you approach making those changes in an established business like yours? Good question. Uh, I've got an answer for you, but just before I do, just something you said previously about um, it's been a relatively smooth run so far. Uh, it certainly sounds like that, and it, and it has been going well. But I've definitely there's definitely a struggle there because you know I've given up and sacrificed a lot to to put everything into this. Um, you know, give home ownership. Um, you know, really had to budget and live tight for pretty much since I finished university, you know. Uh, so uh, I'm not living on a yacht somewhere in luxury and enjoying all this money coming in because what's, whatever's coming in is going straight back onto my debts. So it's like a, a merry-go-round. So there's definitely a lot of sacrifice there. Um, but I'm happy with where I am. To answer that question, look, really it's, it's an acknowledgement that older clients get older. <laughs> um, they leave, they, they die, sadly. I've had a number of clients pass away. And that's not a safe and secure revenue stream. So it's an acknowledgement between all four of us that we need to future-proof the business and that means for our 61, 62-year-old clients, we need to help their kids, okay? We need to get their kids in to help them. We need to start getting um, more clients in that we're going to see another whole cycle through. So really that's the motivation is knowing that older clients get older, bounces diminish and their, um, their complexities diminish and some of them get sick and pass away. So we basically have made lots of tiny little changes in the last probably two to three years just to, just to change a, it tweak something here or change a wording here or change a, a branding here and we obviously refreshed our branding and now we have a unique offering for 30s, 40s and families which has only been done recently. Yeah. And and so and Andre was clearly pretty open, open to to that when he went through it. Yes, it's not to say we're not taking on, uh, you know, we're not taking on older clients or retirees. I mean, pre-retirees would be fantastic still, but we really want to make it clear to all our clients, especially our retiree clients, that we haven't communicated very well previously. But we can help your kids, and it's not just with managing their super. No. We can do lots of other things for your kids that they probably don't know. Uh, and so it's just basically getting that out and communicating that to our clients regularly. Yeah. And so we look at intergenerational planning. So if we have 12 clients coming in for review in May, 
uh, and I look at that list that who's coming in and I know they've got um, young kids or kids in their 30s, they've got grandkids, we'll send them out a, a pack in the mail which is sort of telling them this is how we can help your kids uh, and as a prompter and then in the meeting when I've got the door closed, I've got some time to catch our breath and actually have a conversation. I'll bring up that, um, that pack that we sent them and start talking about the kids and how we can help and the bank kids and everything family orientated. Awesome. And and any challenges implementing diff, that sort of different advice within the, the business where you hadn't previously focused on that? Um, no, not really. I mean, we, no, not really. No, I mean, we've got, we've got, we use X-Plan as our um, software provider, um, which we're not thrilled about, but, but often with templated SOA, you know, makers and, and CRMs, you've got to, you know, in things manually and, and change up the, the templates a little bit to, to make it suit to what you, you're doing. But no, not really. No. no. Awesome. Well, look, I suppose that's a, that's another uh, rabbit hole that uh, we could keep going with uh, with all, all day. Um, I've got another another question here from Joe, who's watching on on Facebook, just asking about how long you're in advice for uh, and, uh, and 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 how you come to evaluations, but. Uh, Joe, that that's uh, that was covered just uh, must have been just before you jumped on. So uh, feel free to go back and watch the the replay, which is going to be uh, posted onto it, the YouTube channel uh, post this session. Uh, awesome. Well, that was uh, that was all I had. Uh, it's been great to hear uh, about your uh, your journey into the business, and I think succession is a is a very key area, as you say, with all clients getting older, a lot of the buyers getting older. Um, as well, Clay, was there anything I missed? Uh, yeah, so I just uh, want to talk about the human piece for two seconds. So um, I think what's really interesting about this topic is that it's very hard to do. Ben, yourself, you, you, you found uh, that when you tried to do it in a, in a previous role. I think a lot of people really struggle with it. I think what generally happens is an advisor will say, oh yeah, that's a great idea sometime in the future and it never gets contracting them when push comes up, so to speak, you know, uh, uh, typically the advisor goes running. That hasn't been your experience. And, and listening to you, um, it, you know, it looks like you probably just came in really focused um, and almost, you know, vicariously picked up the job as the boss over time. And so it, it almost sounds very natural the way that you do it. I guess my question is, are you happy with the result um, and, and considering that you are probably putting in a lot more work than, than, um, than Andre who's, who's on sabbatical um, and then putting a lot of that money back in his pocket um, to pay down the loan also for him to receive dividends. Mm -hmm. uh, is the whole thing, are you, are you, do you look at it and do you say, yeah, I'm really glad that I did it? Yes, um, so I, yeah, I receive, I don't just receive a profit share um, from the business based on how much I own, I receive um, a salary like any other employee as well. So yeah, so I'm working in the business, I'm getting a salary and that's how that works. Uh, I'm very happy, look, the way I've, look, my, my approach has changed a little bit in, in the last six months or so. I guess I was really, really set, and we all were set on, on me taking over 100% eventually. The only thing I'm not happy with is the, the speed in which it's panned out. Um, a lot of people will think, well, it's gone so quickly. Why are you unhappy? But we had a set plan. But again, with, with my inability to continue um, taking up additional funding, um, it's really hamstrung the timeline that we had in, our, in the back of our heads. So I'm really open now. I'm thinking, you know, well, I could take 100 one day. I could just move up to a, 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 a very high majority share and, and let the rest run off. We could get another partner in one day. We we're really trying to keep a very open mind. I think yeah. because what happened for a while is I got very narrow minded. I got set on this magic number. Um, yeah. It's very easy to do for someone like me and, and it can get you down. So I tried to open up and say, let's keep working hard. Let's do the best we can do. And, you know, if things change uh, slightly, the plan alters a little bit, that's okay. We'll just deal with it and we'll make the best we can. Does that answer your question? Yeah, 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 yes it does. And the other thing is, in my head, if this doesn't work out and in three or four years time, we're not where we want it to be and it just doesn't work out, all the hard work that we're putting in now, we're increasing the value of the business, you have to remember. 
Okay, yeah. the value of the business is stagnant. It's increasing. All right? Your recurring revenue is, is increasing, and it's so there's always going to be the opportunity for, for someone like me to to exit at one point in time if that was what was. Have you, when was the last time you had a chat with Mac Bank, for example? Because I know that they do it. Their business banking is directly with um, financial planning firms. And yeah, I did talk to those guys. Yeah. Yeah. A couple of years ago, the problem was. Um, Keeping it high level, the problem was because I had nothing to offer in terms of equity. You know, obviously, it would take a charge over the business and, and, and the units and you know, the clients, but yeah. they wanted additional um, offerings from the other director, um, pers personal, yeah. personal offerings. So well, that, now that now that's changed, so now you do own a portion of the business. And well, this so was this was, in, this was even when I did own a portion. I did oh, have an equity. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah. Look, that, things may have changed. You know, what you're you're spot on. And things may have changed in the last two to two and a half years. It's probably yeah. helpful for me to, to talk to some people and, and refresh it. Um, yeah, I, I, I think there'd, there'd probably be even someone who would be watching this who, who would probably be able to help you if you wanted it. Yeah. And so just to follow up on that, that question, Dylan, because obviously you come into the business, you're working your butt off, you um, you, you know, making changes and connecting with new clients and looking after the clients for, for you, because what do you see as the main uh, advantage of you buying into the established business? Like, do you see it as that taking that step? It makes, it gives you a bit more security because you're already sort of there as an employee and, um, you know, you're getting warm handovers to the clients or do you approach it more as like you're, effectively you're just buying a book over time, but doing it in a staged way? Um, I'm not really sure how to answer that other than, you know, I felt a part of the business once we start having all the client meetings with me in the meetings. So every client know me, knows me really personally. Uh, I don't really know how to answer that other than, um, you know, I've worked really, really hard and I've sacrificed a lot to have the, the shed that I have now. I'm a 37% equity holder at the moment and mm. I haven't looked back. I mean, yeah. Well, it's very impressive. Go for it. Go for it. Yeah, it's very impressive. I, I, I haven't seen or heard of someone uh, pull it off as smoothly um, and uh, as you have. So it's it's really good to hear someone's doing what we all sort of hear, you know, is the is the ultimate pathway. Um, so yeah, man, thank you for coming on and, and sharing your story because it's great to to see someone do it. Yeah, thanks, Clayton. The most important thing, and I'm just I'm pulling out points that I've just remembered from a few moments ago, the most important thing I think somebody mentioned it about if there's anyone that's looking to buy in or, or, or do what I've done, you've really got to make sure that your values and your culture and the way that you approach the world and your clients is exactly the same as the person who you're buying from or the, or the firm because if there's any hint of unalignment, it's just not going to work. It's just not going to work. I think Amanda mentioned that in a comment somewhere some months ago. You've got to be really careful. You've got to be on the same page. You've got to have the same value or similar values. Um, there really has to be a clear connection because uh, you guys have just mentioned it, it can turn out pretty bad. Mm. Cool. Yeah, absolutely. And it sounds like from what you're saying that there's uh, a lot of sort of the right, uh, right place, right time, right values. Uh, I go buy a lottery ticket if I was you, Dylan. I reckon with that, <laughs> with that sort of life. Yeah, well, I know it's a lot of hard work as well. So I'm not trying to take away from the work because I know that you work your, your butt off in your business. But uh, mm. yeah, I think it's it's great. As Clay said, it's great to see uh, someone where it does does work out um, for them as well. So hopefully, we've given some motivation to uh, the the aspiring advisors and the aspiring business owners. Um, yeah, look, ninety five percent of our Ongoing, of our total income is, is ongoing and probably on any given year, five, five to seven percent is up front. So um, that's fantastic and we're just continually building on that. But um, the one thing that I, I'm really passionate about is giving um, insurance advice. I've got three young kids under seven, right, and a whole lot of debt on my shoulders. So yeah. I've got to say as well, it sounds funny, but the best thing, actually the best thing for my career, hands down, was having kids. I'm not even kidding. Awesome, the best man. thing. And because you know, I can have those conversations with, with clients of any age really, really easily and genuinely, yeah. whereas uh, it was a skill set and something that Andre just 
uh, either didn't do or wasn't interested in. So that's been another good, um, the first couple of years, there's a massive uptake in that um, part of the business because it was never done. It was done very little. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So we've got some great tips there. Stick to your style with your negotiations and or with your discussions. Uh, under promise and over deliver. I think uh, everyone can learn from that. Uh, make sure you've got that real clear values alignment and uh, have kids in your 20s so that you can have great conversations <laughs> with your clients. Yeah, right. I'm, th I'm 30 in two years, so we'll see how we go. <laughs> nice. Awesome. Well, look, Dylan, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your story. Uh, it's been great. I hope you guys watching in uh, have enjoyed it. Our very first at Facebook live stream as well. So, uh, yeah, uh, awesome. And, and great to have one of the most, the loudest voices in the Facebook group for the first Facebook live stream. So uh, thank you again. Uh, another thank you to our mates at AIA for, uh, for uh, supporting the XY live sessions. Uh, next week we've got Chris McCarty. Uh, we'll uh, shoot an email with a, with a save the date, but going forward, we're going to be streaming these uh, live onto Facebook and then uh, the replays will be going up onto the YouTube channel as normal. Uh, so if you have anything and the podcast on your uh, podcast radio station thing of preference, you can tell I'm a podcast pro uh, when I say that, I am sure. Um, so thank you everyone for joining. Uh, see you next week. Thanks, Go. guys. Awesome. And thanks, Dylan. Thanks, man. Yeah, thanks, guys. Love the group. Love the energy. Keep it up. Cheers, man. Cheers, team.